Notice, third-party citizenship study guides, tests, and questions. The only official study guide for the citizenship test is Discover Canada, the Rights and Responsibilities of Citizenship, which is available from Citizenship and Immigration Canada at no cost. If you have applied for citizenship and are preparing for the citizenship test, your primary resource should be the official study guide. If you use any other material to prepare for the citizenship test, you do so at your own risk. Discover Canada, the rights and responsibilities of citizenship. Study guide. The oath of citizenship. I swear or affirm that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada, her heirs and successors, and that I will faithfully observe the laws of Canada and fulfill my duties as a Canadian citizen. Le serment de citoyenneté. Je jure, ou j'affirme solennellement, que je serai fidèle et porterai sincère allégeance à Sa Majesté, la Reine Elizabeth II, Reine du Canada, à ses héritiers et successeurs que j'observerai fidèlement les lois du Canada et que je remplirai loyalement mes obligations de citoyen canadien. Understanding the Oath In Canada, we profess our loyalty to a person who represents all Canadians and not to a document such as a constitution, a banner such as a flag, or a geopolitical entity such as a country. In our constitutional monarchy, these elements are encompassed by the sovereign, a queen or king. It is a remarkably simple yet powerful principle. Canada is personified by the sovereign, just as the sovereign is personified by Canada. Message to our readers, welcome. It took courage to move to a new country. Your decision to apply for citizenship is another big step. You are becoming part of a great tradition that was built by generations of pioneers before you. Once you have met all the legal requirements, we hope to welcome you as a new citizen with all the rights and responsibilities of citizenship. Canada has welcomed generations of newcomers to our shores to help us build a free, law-abiding and prosperous society. For 400 years, settlers and immigrants have contributed to the diversity and richness of our country, which is built on a proud history and a strong identity. Canada is a constitutional monarchy, a parliamentary democracy and a federal state. Canadians are bound together by a shared commitment to the rule of law and to the institutions of parliamentary government. Canadians take pride in their identity and have made sacrifices to defend their way of life. By coming to Canada and taking this important step towards Canadian citizenship, you are helping to write the continuing story of Canada. Immigrants between the ages of 18 and 54 must have adequate knowledge of English or French in order to become Canadian citizens. You must also learn about voting procedures, Canada's history, symbols, democratic institutions, geography, and the rights and responsibilities of citizenship. Canadian citizens enjoy many rights, but Canadians also have responsibilities. They must obey Canada's laws and respect the rights and freedoms of others. This guide will help you prepare to become a Canadian citizen. Good luck. For information about Citizenship and Immigration Canada, visit our website at www.cic.gc.ca. Applying for Citizenship. 
When you apply for citizenship, officials will check your status, verify that you are not prohibited from applying, and ensure that you meet the requirements. Your application may take several months. Please ensure that the call center always has your correct address while your application is being processed. Telephone numbers will be supplied at the conclusion of this audio guide. Caption. Images of citizens taking the oath. How to use this booklet to prepare for the citizenship test. This booklet will help you prepare for the citizenship test. You should study this guide, ask a friend or family member to help you practice answering questions about Canada, call a local school or school board, a college, a community centre or a local organisation that provides services to immigrants and ask for information on citizenship classes. Take English or French language classes which the Government of Canada offers free of charge. About the citizenship test. The citizenship test is usually a written test, but it could be an interview. You will be tested on two basic requirements for citizenship. One, knowledge of Canada and of the rights and responsibilities of citizenship. And two, adequate knowledge of English or French. Adult applicants 55 years of age and over do not need to write the citizenship test. The citizenship regulations provide information on how your ability to meet the knowledge of Canada requirement is determined. Information about these regulations will be provided later in this audio guide. All the citizenship test questions are based on the subject areas noted in the citizenship regulations and all required information is provided in this study guide. After the test, if you pass the test and meet all the other requirements, you will receive a notice to appear to take the oath of citizenship. This document tells you the date, time and place of your citizenship ceremony. At the ceremony, you will take the oath of citizenship, sign the oath form, and receive your Canadian citizenship certificate. If you do not pass the test, you will receive a notification indicating the next steps. You are encouraged to bring your family and friends to celebrate this occasion. Rights and Responsibilities of Citizenship Canadian citizens have rights and responsibilities these come to us from our history, are secured by Canadian law, and reflect our shared traditions, identity, and values. Canadian law has several sources, including laws passed by Parliament and the provincial legislatures, English common law, the Civil Code of France, and the unwritten constitution that we have inherited from Great Britain. Together, these secure for Canadians an 800-year-old tradition of ordered liberty, which dates back to the signing of Magna Carta in 1215 in England, also known as the Great Charter of Freedoms, including freedom of conscience and religion, freedom of thought, belief, opinion and expression, including freedom of speech and of the press, freedom of peaceful assembly, and freedom of association. Habeas corpus, the right to challenge unlawful detention by the state, comes from English common law. The Constitution of Canada was amended in 1982 to entrench the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which begins with the words, Whereas Canada is founded upon principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law. This phrase underlines the importance of religious traditions to Canadian society and the dignity and worth of the human person. 
The Charter attempts to summarize fundamental freedoms while also setting out additional rights. The most important of these include mobility rights. Canadians can live and work anywhere they choose in Canada, enter and leave the country freely, and apply for a passport. Aboriginal people's rights. The rights guaranteed in the Charter will not adversely affect any treaty or other rights or freedoms of Aboriginal peoples. Official language rights and minority language educational rights. French and English have equal status in Parliament and throughout the government. Multiculturalism, a fundamental characteristic of the Canadian heritage and identity. Canadians celebrate the gift of one another's presence and work hard to respect pluralism and live in harmony. Caption, image of Queen Elizabeth II proclaiming the amended constitution in Ottawa in 1982. The equality of women and men. In Canada, men and women are equal under the law. Canada's openness and generosity do not extend to barbaric cultural practices that tolerate spousal abuse, honor killings, female genital mutilation, forced marriage, or other gender-based violence. Those guilty of these crimes are severely punished under Canada's criminal laws. Citizenship responsibilities. In Canada, rights come with responsibilities. These include obeying the law. One of Canada's founding principles is the rule of law. Individuals and governments are regulated by laws and not by arbitrary actions. No person or group is above the law. Taking responsibility for oneself and one's family, getting a job, taking care of one's family, and working hard in keeping with one's abilities are important Canadian values. Work contributes to personal dignity and self-respect and to Canada's prosperity. Serving on a jury, when called to do so, you are legally required to serve. Serving on a jury is a privilege that makes the justice system work, as it depends on impartial juries made up of citizens. Voting in elections. The right to vote comes with a responsibility to vote in federal, provincial, or territorial and local elections. Helping others in the community. Millions of volunteers freely donate their time to help others without pay by helping people in need, assisting at your child's school, volunteering at a food bank or other charity, or encouraging newcomers to integrate. Volunteering is an excellent way to gain useful skills and develop friends and contacts. Protecting and enjoying our heritage and environment. Every citizen has a role to play in avoiding waste and pollution while protecting Canada's natural, cultural, and architectural heritage for future generations. Defending Canada. There is no compulsory military service in Canada. However, serving in the regular Canadian forces, Navy, Army and Air Force is a noble way to contribute to Canada and an excellent career choice. More information can be obtained online from the Canadian Forces website at www.forces.ca. You can serve in your local part-time Navy, Militia and Air Reserves and gain valuable experience, skills, and contacts. Young people can learn discipline, responsibility, and skills by getting involved in the cadets. More information can be obtained online from the Canadian Cadet Organization's website at www.cadets.ca. You may also serve in the Coast Guard or emergency services in your community such as a police force or fire department. 
By helping to protect your community, you follow in the footsteps of Canadians before you who made sacrifices in the service of our country. Who we are. Canada is known around the world as a strong and free country. Canadians are proud of their unique identity. We have inherited the oldest continuous constitutional tradition in the world. We are the only constitutional monarchy in North America. Our institutions uphold a commitment to peace, order and good government, a key phrase in Canada's original constitutional document in 1867, the British North America Act. A belief in ordered liberty, enterprise, hard work and fair play have enabled Canadians to build a prosperous society in a rugged environment from our Atlantic shores to the Pacific Ocean and to the Arctic Circle. So much so that poets and songwriters have hailed Canada as the Great Dominion. To understand what it means to be Canadian, it is important to know about our three founding peoples, Aboriginal, French and British. Caption. Images of a Métis man from Alberta. Of a Cree dancer. Of Inuit children in Iqaluit, Nunavut. And of the Haida artist Bill Reed carving a totem pole. Aboriginal peoples. The ancestors of Aboriginal peoples are believed to have migrated from Asia many thousands of years ago. They were well established here long before explorers from Europe first came to North America. Diverse, vibrant First Nations cultures were rooted in religious beliefs about their relationship to the Creator, the natural environment, and each other. Aboriginal and treaty rights are in the Canadian Constitution. Territorial rights were first guaranteed through the Royal Proclamation of 1763 by King George III and established the basis for negotiating treaties with newcomers, treaties that were not always fully respected. From the 1800s until the 1980s, the federal government placed many Aboriginal children in residential schools to educate and assimilate them into mainstream Canadian culture. The schools were poorly funded and inflicted hardship on the students. Some were physically abused. Aboriginal languages and cultural practices were mostly prohibited. In 2008, Ottawa formally apologized to the former students. In today's Canada, Aboriginal peoples enjoyed renewed pride and confidence and have made significant achievements in agriculture, the environment, business, and the arts. Today, the term Aboriginal peoples refer to three distinct groups. Indian refers to all Aboriginal people who are not Inuit or Métis. In the 1970s, the term First Nations began to be used. Today, about half of First Nations people live on reserve land in about 600 communities, while the other half live off reserve mainly in urban centers. The Inuit, which means the people in the Inuktitut language, live in small, scattered communities across the Arctic. Their knowledge of the land, sea, and wildlife enabled them to adapt to one of the harshest environments on Earth. The Métis are a distinct people of mixed Aboriginal and European ancestry, the majority of whom live in the Prairie Provinces. They come from both French and English-speaking backgrounds and speak their own dialect, Mishif. About 65% of the Aboriginal people are First Nations, while 30% are Métis and 4% Inuit. Unity in Diversity John Buchan, the first Baron Tweedsmuir, was a popular Governor General of Canada in 1935 to 1940. In a speech to the Canadian Club of Halifax in 1937, he noted that immigrant groups should retain their individuality and each make its contribution to the national character. Each could learn from the other, and while they cherish their own special loyalties and traditions, they cherish not less that new loyalty and tradition which springs from their union. The 15th Governor General is shown in blood Kainai First Nation headdress. Caption, 
images of the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Montreal, Quebec, a Highland dancer in Maxville, Ontario, a family celebrating Fête Nationale in Gatineau, Quebec, and of an Acadian fiddler in Village of Grand Anse, New Brunswick. English and French. Canadian society today stems largely from the English-speaking and French-speaking Christian civilizations that were brought here from Europe by settlers. English and French define the reality of day-to-day -day life for most people and are the country's official languages. The federal government is required by law to provide services throughout Canada in English and French. Today, there are 18 million Anglophones, people who speak English as a first language, and 7 million Francophones, people who speak French as their first language. While the majority of Francophones live in the province of Quebec, 1 million Francophones live in Ontario, New Brunswick, and Manitoba, with a smaller presence in other provinces. New Brunswick is the only officially bilingual province. The Acadians are the descendants of French colonists who began settling in what are now the Maritime Provinces in 1604. Between 1755 and 1763, during the war between Britain and France, more than two-thirds of the Acadians were deported from their homeland. Despite this ordeal, known as the Great Upheaval, the Acadians survived and maintained their unique identity Today, Acadian culture is flourishing and is a lively part of French-speaking Canada. Quebecers are the people of Quebec, the vast majority French-speaking. Most are descendants of 8,500 French settlers from the 1600s and 1700s and maintain a unique identity, culture, and language. The House of Commons recognized in 2006 that the Québécois form a nation within a united Canada. One million Anglo-Quebecers have a heritage of 250 years and form a vibrant part of the Quebec fabric. The basic way of life in English-speaking areas was established by hundreds of thousands of English, Welsh, Scottish and Irish settlers, soldiers and migrants from the 1600s to the 20th century. Generations of pioneers and builders of British origins, as well as other groups, invested and endured hardship in laying the foundations of our country. This helps explain why Anglophones, or English speakers, are generally referred to as English Canadians. Becoming Canadian. Some Canadians immigrate from places where they have experienced warfare or conflict. Such experiences do not justify bringing to Canada violent, extreme, or hateful prejudices. In becoming Canadian, newcomers are expected to embrace democratic principles, such as the rule of law. Caption, images of the celebration of cultures in Edmonton, Alberta, of Ismaili Muslims in the Calgary Stampede, Alberta, of the Caribbean Cultural Festival in Toronto, Ontario, of the Ukrainian Pizanka Festival in Vegreville, Alberta, of young Polish dancers in Oliver, British Columbia, and of the pipes and drums in Ottawa. Diversity in Canada. The majority of Canadians were born in this country, and this has been true since the 1800s. However, Canada is often referred to as a land of immigrants, because over the past 200 years, millions of newcomers have helped to build and defend our way of life. Many ethnic and religious groups live and work in peace as proud Canadians. The largest groups are the English, French, Scottish, Irish, German, Italian, Chinese, Aboriginal, Ukrainian, Dutch, South Asian, and Scandinavian. Since the 1970s, most immigrants have come from Asian countries. Non-official languages are widely spoken in Canadian homes. Chinese languages are the second most spoken at home after English in two of Canada's biggest cities. In Vancouver, 13% of the population speak Chinese languages at home. In Toronto, the number is 7%. 
The great majority of Canadians identify as Christians. The largest religious affiliation is Catholic, followed by various Protestant churches. The numbers of Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Sikhs, and members of other religions, as well as people who state no religion, are also growing. In Canada, the state has traditionally partnered with faith communities to promote social welfare, harmony, and mutual respect, to provide schools and health care, to resettle refugees, and to uphold religious freedom, religious expression, and freedom of conscience. Canada's diversity includes gay and lesbian Canadians who enjoy the full protection of and equal treatment under the law, including access to civil marriage. Together, these diverse groups sharing a common Canadian identity make up today's multicultural society. Caption, images of Christmas in Gatineau, Chinese Canadian war veterans, Notre Dame des Victoires in Quebec City, and the Chinese New Year celebration in Vancouver. Image of Marjorie Turner Bailey with caption, Olympian Marjorie Turner Bailey of Nova Scotia is a descendant of black loyalists, escaped slaves and freed men and women of African origin who in the 1780s fled to Canada from America where slavery remained legal until 1863. Canada's history, Aboriginal peoples. When Europeans explored Canada, they found all regions occupied by native peoples they called Indians because the first explorers thought they had reached the East Indies. The native people lived off the land, some by hunting and gathering, others by raising crops. The Huron-Wendat of the Great Lake region, like the Iroquois, were farmers and hunters. The Cree and Dene of the Northwest were hunter-gatherers. The Sioux were nomadic following the bison or buffalo herd. The Inuit lived off Arctic wildlife. West Coast natives preserved fish by drying and smoking. Warfare was common among Aboriginal groups as they competed for land, resources, and prestige. The arrival of the European traders, missionaries, soldiers, and colonists changed the native way of life forever. Large numbers of Aboriginals died of European diseases to which they lacked immunity. However, Aboriginals and Europeans formed strong economic, religious, and military bonds in the first 200 years of coexistence, which laid the foundations of Canada. Caption, image of an Indian encampment during fur trade era. The first Europeans. The Vikings from Iceland who colonized Greenland a thousand years ago also reached Labrador and the island of Newfoundland. The remains of their settlement, Lance au Meadow, are a world heritage site. European exploration began in earnest in 1497 with the expedition of John Cabot, who was the first to draw a map of Canada's east coast. Image of John Cabot with caption. John Cabot, an Italian immigrant to England was the first to map Canada's Atlantic shore, setting foot on Newfoundland or Cape Breton Island in 1497 and claiming the new found land for England. English settlement did not begin until 1610. Exploring a river, naming Canada. Between 1534 and 1542, Jacques Cartier made three voyages across the Atlantic claiming the land for King Francis I of France. Cartier heard two captured guides speak the Iroquoian word Anata, meaning village. By the 1550s, the name of Canada began appearing on maps. Image of Jacques Cartier with caption. Jacques Cartier was the first European to explore the St. Lawrence River and to set eyes on present day Quebec City and Montreal. Royal New France. In 1604, the first European settlement north of Florida was established by French explorers Pierre de Mont and Samuel de Champlain. First on St. Croix Island in present-day Maine, 
then at Port Royal in Acadia, present-day Nova Scotia. In 1608, Champlain built a fortress at what is now Quebec City. The colonists struggled against a harsh climate. Champlain allied the colony with the Algonquin, Montagné, and Huron, historic enemies of the Iroquois, a confederation of five, later six, First Nations who battled with the French settlements for a century. The French and the Iroquois made peace in 1701. The French and Aboriginal people collaborated in the vast fur trade economy driven by the demand for beaver pelts in Europe. Outstanding leaders like Jean Talon, Bishop Laval, and Count Frontenac built a French empire in North America that reached from Hudson Bay to the Gulf of Mexico. Image of Count Frontenac with caption. Count Frontenac refused to surrender Quebec to the English in 1690 saying, my only reply will be from the mouths of my cannons. Image of Pierre Lemoyne with caption. Pierre Lemoyne, Sieur d'Iberville, was a great hero of New France, winning many victories over the English from James Bay in the north to Navy in the Caribbean in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. Struggle for a continent. In 1670, King Charles II of England granted the Hudson's Bay Company exclusive trading rights over the watershed draining into Hudson Bay. For the next hundred years, the company competed with Montreal-based traders. The skilled and courageous men who traveled by canoe were called voyageurs and coureurs des bois and formed strong alliances with First Nations. English colonies along the Atlantic seaboard dating from the early 1600s eventually became richer and more populous than New France. In the 1700s, France and Great Britain battled for control of North America. In 1759, the British defeated the French in the Battle of the Plains of Abraham at Quebec City, marking the end of France's empire in America. The commanders of both armies, Brigadier James Wolfe and the Marquis de Montcalm, were killed leading their troops in battle. The Province of Quebec. Following the war, Great Britain renamed the colony the Province of Quebec. The French-speaking Catholic people known as Habitants or Canadiens strove to preserve their way of life in the English-speaking Protestant-ruled British Empire. A tradition of accommodation. To better govern the French Roman Catholic majority, the British Parliament passed the Quebec Act of 1774. One of the constitutional foundations of Canada, the Quebec Act, accommodated the principles of British institutions to the reality of the province. It allowed religious freedom for Catholics and permitted them to hold public office, a practice not then allowed in Britain. The Quebec Act restored French civil law while maintaining British criminal law. Image of Sir Guy Carleton with caption. Sir Guy Carleton, also called Lord Dorchester, as governor of Quebec, defended the rights of the Canadiens, defeated an American military invasion of Quebec in 1775, and supervised the loyalist migration to Nova Scotia and Quebec in 1782 and 83. United Empire Loyalists. In 1776, the 13 British colonies to the south of Quebec declared independence and formed the United States. North America was again divided by war. More than 40,000 people loyal to the crown, called loyalists, fled the oppression of the American Revolution to settle in Nova Scotia and Quebec. Joseph Brandt led thousands of loyalist Mohawk Indians into Canada. The loyalists came from Dutch, German, British, Scandinavian, Aboriginal, and other origins, and from Presbyterian, Anglican, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Quaker, and Catholic religious backgrounds. About 3,000 black loyalists, freedmen, and slaves came north seeking a better life. In turn, in 1792, some black Nova Scotians who were given poor land moved on to establish Freetown, Sierra Leone, West Africa, 
a new British colony for freed slaves. The beginnings of democracy. Democratic institutions developed gradually and peacefully. The first representative assembly was elected in Halifax, Nova Scotia in 1758. Prince Edward Island followed in 1773, New Brunswick in 1785. The Constitutional Act of 1791 divided the province of Quebec into Upper Canada, later Ontario, which was mainly Loyalist, Protestant and English speaking, and Lower Canada, later Quebec, heavily Catholic and French speaking. The Act also granted to the Canadas, for the first time, legislative assemblies elected by the people. The name Canada also became official at this time and has been used ever since. The Atlantic colonies and the two Canadas were known collectively as British North America. Image of the Assembly of Lower Canada with caption. The first elected Assembly of Lower Canada in Quebec City debates whether to use both French and English. January the 21st, 1793. Abolition of Slavery. Slavery has existed all over the world from Asia, Africa, and the Middle East to the Americas. The first movement to abolish the transatlantic slave trade emerged in the British Parliament in the late 1700s. In 1793, Upper Canada, led by Lieutenant Governor John Graves Simcoe, a loyalist military officer, became the first province in the empire to move toward abolition. In 1807, the British Parliament prohibited the buying and selling of slaves, and in 1833 abolished slavery throughout the empire. Thousands of slaves escaped from the United States, followed the North Star, and settled in Canada via the Underground Railroad, a Christian anti-slavery network. Image of Lieutenant Colonel John Graves Simcoe with caption. Lieutenant Colonel John Graves Simcoe was Upper Canada's first Lieutenant Governor and founder of the City of York, now Toronto. Simcoe also made Upper Canada the first province in the British Empire to abolish slavery. Image of Mary Ann Shad Carey with caption. Mary Ann Shad Carey was an outspoken activist in the movement to abolish slavery in the USA. In 1853, she became the first woman publisher in Canada, helping to found and edit The Provincial Freeman, a weekly newspaper dedicated to anti-slavery, black immigration to Canada, temperance, urging people to drink less alcohol, and upholding British rule.